All right, everybody, I have got six o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started tonight for our Pollinators 101. Um, thank you for joining us. I want to welcome you all um, to our webinar. We're excited to have you here. Um, before we get started tonight, I do want to mention um, a couple other things uh, before we get into the presentation, just a few housekeeping things. Um, so tonight we are recording the presentation. Uh, we're going to make that available after the webinar on the Missourians for Monarchs and the Missouri Quail Forever YouTube channels. Um, we'll also email the link to of the recording to everyone who registered for the webinar. Um, so look for an email probably early next week with the link to tonight's recording. Um, everyone's microphones are muted. Um, so I did see one question come in asking if microphones are muted. Um, they are. Everyone's are muted except for, for us, our, the presenters tonight. Um, so we can't hear anyone and your cameras are off too. So we can't hear or see you. Uh, you should just be able to hear um, us as presenters and then see our screen as we share that. Um, so you guys can all just sit back and relax and enjoy the presentation. Um, since your microphones are muted and we won't be able to hear you if you have any questions, um, if you do have questions um, throughout the webinar, there is a Q&A feature. Um, there's a little button at the toolbar down at the bottom and you can see that little picture of, of, of an image of what that Q&A button looks like. So if you've got questions, um, go ahead and type those in that Q&A box. We've got some um, staff with us tonight who are helping answer those questions in the Q&A box as we go along. Um, but then we're also gonna take some time at the end of the presentation tonight as well um, to read some of those questions and provide some answers to those out loud. Um, so that's just a little bit about our housekeeping stuff tonight. Um, I do wanna introduce our presenters. Um, so I'm Kim Cole. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Quail Forever and Pheasants Forever in Missouri. Um, I'm gonna be one of the presenters tonight. We've got uh, two other presenters as well. Elizabeth Egan is with us. She is the Communications Coordinator for Missourians for Monarchs. Uh, we've also got Donna Marie Duffin. She is the Monarch and Pollinator Coordinator for Missourians for Monarchs. Um, so we'll be the, the three presenting tonight. Um, and I do, before I get started, um, before I turn it over to Elizabeth to kind of get into the presentation, I did want to take a little bit um, to let everybody know about Quill Forever and Pheasants Forever in case you aren't um, familiar with us prior to hearing about tonight's webinar. Um, so real quick, just the mission for Quail Forever and Pheasants Forever is to conserve quail, pheasants, and other wildlife through habitat improvements, public access, education, and conservation advocacy. Um, and we achieve our mission. You can kind of see in the, the pictures that I've got shared there, um, some of our staff and some of our chapter members out. Um, but we basically, we achieve our mission um, through, our, through the efforts of those members, our staff, our volunteer chapters throughout the state, um, and numerous partners as well. So that's a little bit about Quail Forever and Pheasants Forever. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth now and let her talk a little bit about Missourians for Monarchs and then get us started for our pollinators presentation tonight. Hello everybody, thank you for joining us. My name is Elizabeth Egan. As Kim mentioned, I am the Communications Coordinator for Missourians for Monarchs. So Missourians for Monarchs is a collaborative of over 40 organizations representing nonprofits, the public sector, and the private sector. The mission of Missourians for Monarchs is to engage Missourians to increase and sustain habitat for monarch butterflies and pollinators through community involvement and to seek ways for partners, communities, and agencies to coordinate similar efforts. So now that you know a little bit about us, let's go on into the presentation. In this presentation, we will discuss what pollinators are, what they do, and why they are important. We will focus on the monarch butterfly as an example, explore what you can do to support pollinators near you. At the end, we will list resources for you to use and experts to contact. Please note that website links for all that we talk about will be sent in a follow-up email next week. So what is a pollinator or what is pollination? Pollination is when a pollen grain moves from the male part of a flower, the anther, to the female part of the flower, the stigma. 85 to 95 percent of plants need a pollinator or a pollination vector to achieve pollination. This is called cross-pollination. Here you can see that the pollinator has pollen on its leg. It's transferring it from one flower to the other. So what are pollinators? Pollinators are the way pollen is transferred. 
Think of them as little taxis that take pollen from one place to another. Do you see any pollinators on this list that might surprise you? We know that butterflies and bees are pollinators, but beetles, flies, and bats can definitely be surprising. Two other surprising pollinators are wind and water. A pollination vector does not have to be living to move pollen. Today, we'll focus on just the living pollination vectors. So over time, plants have developed pollinator syndromes to attract pollinators. Pollinator syndromes are suites of traits that include color, nectar guides, odor, nectar, pollen, and flower shape. Let's use butterflies as an example. So butterflies prefer bright colors. They want to see those nectar guides to lead them to the nectar sources. A faint but fresh odor, they really like that. Um, they like a limited pollen supply and either narrow tubular flowers or wide landing pad like you see in both of these photos. Knowing what pollinators in your area are attracted to can help when you're planning a pollinator habitat. Kim, I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to you. Excellent, can you see my slides? Okay, perfect, just making sure. Awesome. Okay, well, what I'm going to do now, um, thank you, Elizabeth, that was an awesome introduction to, to pollination and what pollinators are. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now um, about pollinators, how they're in decline, um, and then just some of the reasons why, um, talk a little bit tonight just about the, the why, why we are are concerned about pollinators, why we should be focused on that. Um, so a little bit about the decline of pollinators. Um, now that we know more about them, let's talk more about why they're our focus, um, but it's, it's widely known that pollinators are in decline. Uh, more than 40% of bee species, which um, bees are our most important pollinator, um, more than 40% of those are classified as threatened. Um, so that's, that's a pretty big number of bee species when we think about it. We're looking at almost half of our bee species. Um, Agriculture producers are starting to have to rely more and more on captive bees, um, and a lot of times these have to be transported in from other states. Um, there's, of course, associated costs with that to get, get those pollinators brought in to help, produce, um, to help pollinate those crops um, to make sure they get successfully pollinated and produced. Um, and there's even a pollinator health task force created by the White House in 2014 um, to address these issues surrounding pollinator health. Um, so it's it's you know a pretty big issue that we're having to deal with these pollinators in decline. Um, so let's talk about some of the reasons. Um, you know where have they gone? Why are we seeing these declines in pollinators? Um, when, when it comes down to it, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, there's a lot of things that are impacting pollinators and causing those declines in their populations. Um, habitat loss is a big one. Um, Losing out on habitat is, is really critical when it comes to those declining po pollinator populations. Um, they're also dealing with threats from pesticides and different environmental contaminants. Um, development, we consider things like monocultures. Um, you can kind of see those, the picture of that residential lawn in the middle, um, or even monocultures that might be caused by non-native and invasive plants that have taken over natural areas. So you can kind of see in that bottom picture, um, some Cerisia lespedeza, a non-native, um, pretty aggressive invasive plant has just kind of made its own monoculture in that natural area. So um, when things like that happen, those are definitely not beneficial to pollinators and um, not doing anything to help ad address those declines that we're dealing with. Um, there's a, a laundry list of threats, um, other threats that they face as well. Um, there's still a lot we don't know about some of those threats and that we're continuing to learn. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of research being done on those declines um, and how they're happening, what we can do to help. Um, but so why does this, why does the decline in pollinator populations matter? You know, why are we, why are we here to, to discuss pollinators tonight? Um, there's a lot of reasons, but you know, to kind of put it simply, it matters um, because pollinators are critically important to agriculture and production, um, critically important to human nutrition and to ecosystem stability. Um, so there's a lot of big things that pollinators impact, um, which makes them really, really important. 
Um, so we look at flowering plants. Uh, more than three quarters of the flowering plants worldwide depend on animal pollinators, um, like some of those that Elizabeth mentioned, the bees, butterflies and moss, um, beetles, and then birds, and even some of those surprise ones like bats as well. Um, all of those help with the reproduction of those flowering plants. Um, this includes more than two thirds of the world's crop species as well. When we look at, at the impact that pollinators have. Um, in the United States alone, we grow more than 100 crops that either need or benefit from pollinators. Um, you can see there's a pretty, pretty long list in that image that's on the right, um, but grain, dairy, and almost all aspects of our diet are potentially impacted when pollinators um, are removed from the equation, when we, when we don't have them there to provide that service of pollination. Um, Again, you can you can see from that picture the list of list of crops or food that's dependent upon those um, pollinators or benefits from that service of pollinators is quite long. Um, so just to reiterate uh, that importance of native pollinators for agriculture a little bit more, um, it's estimated that one out of every three bites of food we eat exists because of animal pollinators and that service that they provide through pollination. Um, there are numerous crops that can only be pollinated by insects and pollinators. Um, some of those are almonds, apples, peaches, oranges, tomatoes, uh, berries, watermelons, and chili peppers. And that sounds like a lot, um, but that's just a short list. Think back to that uh, long list I just showed in the previous slide of, you know, we were looking at 100 plus crops and a long, long list of plants that have to be pollinated um, by insects and, and those pollinators. Um, another thing, additionally, having increased pollinator diversity can help improve crop yields, um, which is in turn going to increase food production. Um, when we talk about um, even in crops like corn and soybeans, um, which are wind and self-pollinated respectively, the presence of honeybees and native pollinators can help boost yields. Um, and some studies have shown that an average of between 6 to 18 percent increase in that, in that crop yield. Um, and there are more than 3,500 species of native bees that are known to help increase crop yields. So the, the impact of pollinators, um, especially that, they can, that they're going to have on agriculture, can be really, really quite large. Um, to to kind of uh, look at this a little, on a little bit bigger scale, um, when pollinators provide pollination services to plants, help increase that food production, um, we're, we're in turn seeing the economic benefits across the globe that they're providing. Um, so again, looking at this on a large scale, Pollinators are estimated to add over 200 billion into the global economy, um, and the economic value of our native pollinators um, just here in the U.S. alone is estimated to be um, somewhere around 3 billion per year. So some really large dollar values that we're looking at. Um, and while we can estimate that, that dollar amount, we can get rough estimates for um, you know, that value that pollinators provide to our economy. When we kind of step back and look at it, um, it's it's really clear that 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 service that they provide through pollination um, is is actually quite invaluable to all of us. Um, so a little bit more, again, about why they're important. Um, through pollination, our native pollinators are supporting healthy ecosystems. Um, those in turn, those healthy ecosystems are going to provide clean air. They're going to stabilize our soils and help prevent erosion, um, protect from impacts of severe weather, and then they're going to support other wildlife. Um, by meeting, helping meet habitat requirements and basic needs. So having that quality habitat is really critical for pollinators to survive um, and, and thus to be able to provide pollination, which is gonna result um, in a lot of benefits for all of us um, in the form of ecosystem services. So just looking at ecosystem services alone, the, the benefit that we get from our native pollinators. Um, when, we, when we implement practices and efforts that benefit pollinators um, or, or benefit their habitat, um, those efforts tend to address other resource concerns that we might be dealing with as well. Landowners might deal with like soil erosion, water quality and quantity, um, air quality, and then plant health. So lots of lots of impacts um, on that ecosystem level that pollinators have um, because of those services that they provide to ecosystems, um, because of their, their unique adaptations to the local climate and soils and vegetation, um, native pollinators they really are immensely uh, valuable to our environment and, and helping keep our environment healthy. So um, we've talked a little bit about that importance. One thing I do wanna focus on tonight um, is habitat. So when we talk about addressing the declines 
um, of pollinators, talk about ways to support the pollinators. Um, they provide all those services to us, thinking about it agriculturally and those ecosystem services. Um, so how can we help them? The, the easiest way to do that is, is with habitat or through habitat. Um, and in other words, if we manage the habitat for pollinators, um, just doing something as simple as helping, helping through habitat, we can uh, make a positive impact and provide some resources that they need. Um, so we know that that habitat loss is a big contributing big big contributor to pollinator decline. And um, we talked about that a few slides earlier. We went over those reasons for decline. Um, and again, habitat loss is, is a big one. If they don't have a habitat to, to live in and, and find those resources they need, those pollinators are going to have a really tough time surviving. Um, so ensuring there's quality habitat. That's really key for helping pollinators um, and good pollinator habitat is going to benefit many other wildlife species as well um, not just those pollinators that we might be intending it for. Um, so how is that habitat uh, beneficial to other wildlife? How does it help other wildlife? Um, just a few things. It provides areas of really high plant diversity um, and that's going to attract obviously a good diversity of pollinators. Um, it's gonna attract a numerous insects, which make a really great food source um, for birds and for other wildlife too. Um, that pollinator habitat is gonna provide cover and it's gonna provide nesting area. Um, so just some potentially really good habitat for cover, for brood rearing, for birds, things like that. Um, these pollinator habitats, when they're these large areas, um, generally they're gonna experience less disturbance from things like mowing or things like pesticides, um, any other types of disturbance. I mean, there's, there's a whole lot more when it comes to those benefits that pollinator habitats provides to other wildlife. Um, but again, it's the pollinator habitat has, has the potential to benefit um, many native species of our pollinators and other wildlife all at the same time. So um, really, really beneficial just for lots of, lots of animals across the board. Um, this, at this point, this is kind of where Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever fits in. Um, so in our eyes, when we look at it, pollinator habitat is, is great habitat for quail and for pheasants I and mean, for, for lots of other wildlife too, um, but it's really great for those upland birds that our organization works to, works to conserve. Um, so that habitat that benefits pollinators, it's gonna benefit upland birds, grassland species of all sorts, um, deer and turkey and lots of other wildlife too. Um, so it, with PF and QF, um, you know, we understand that creating and conserving habitat for pollinators is not only gonna help them, uh, but it's also gonna help us with our mission when it comes to, you know, again, conserving quail and pheasants and other wildlife um, through those, that method of habitat improvement. Um, so we work to create and conserve pollinator habitats in a number of ways at PFQF. Um, we've got Farm Bill Wildlife Biologists. They help landowners manage their acres for wildlife. Um, our volunteer chapters, they host pollinator habitat outreach programs, um, which are public events that help basically help educate the public about pollinators and give them an opportunity to plant pollinator habitat in their local communities. Um, and then we've got many partners who help support our habitat and wildlife conservation efforts. Um, so, you know, habitats, again, it's, it's really important to help address that decline in pollinators. Um, and when we put that pollinator habitat on the ground, we can help a lot of other wildlife at the same time. Let's see, so um, just a quick look at pollinator habitat. We've, we've talked a lot about the importance of it. What does it look like? Um, so just like other wildlife, pollinators are gonna need food, water, shelter, and space. Um, and they're gonna need those habitat requirements to support healthy populations. So when we look at um, pollinator habitat, kind of take a peek at what that looks like. Um, basically, it's an area with a variety of native forbs, um, which is another, another word for flowering plants. Um, but it's got a variety of those flowering plants and they're gonna provide nectar and nesting space. Um, pollinator habitat, it could potentially be a natural setting like a prairie. Um, it could be man-made where it's a diverse mixture of wildflowers that are planted specifically um, to provide a food resource and provide a nesting site for pollinators. Um, if you look at some of the pictures we've got up, you know, a pollinator habitat can look like a CRP field that's been enrolled um, in one of the pollinator focused conservation practices. Um, it can be that picture in the top right. Um, it can be a rough area at a golf course um, so where they've converted your standard rough area on a golf course um, have taken that converted that to pollinator habitat instead so that they're benefiting pollinators and wildlife at the same time. Um, it could potentially be a wildflower field next to crops. Um, I showed a couple of pictures in a, a previous slide 
of a cornfield and then a nice strip of pollinator habitat right next to it. I and mean, we talked about those benefits in crop yield. So pollinator habitat can definitely be, you know, it can be a strip of habitat that occurs right next to a crop field. Um, it can even be a native grazing operation. So we can have good wildflower diversity and good pollinator habitat um, in a grazing operation as well. Um, diversity of plant species is, is pretty key. It's pretty important when we're looking at um, providing quality pollinator habitat, um, especially providing that habitat throughout the year. Um, and native plants are gonna be your best bet to use um, to benefit native pollinators. So a variety of species with different color flowers, different flower shapes, um, and different bloom times, those are going to offer nectar pollen resources um, throughout the growing season from that early spring into the fall. Um, having that diversity of flowers and bloom times and all that's really going to provide a long term resource, um, good quality habitat throughout the seasons for pollinators. And a little bit more about habitat. Um, when you have a variety of native plant species, um, that's also going to provide nesting sites and overwintering sites for a variety of pollinators, um, and again, through, throughout the year, making sure they have those year-long resources. Um, standing stems of native plants provide nesting spots for bees in the spring and summer. They provide hibernation spots in the winter. Um, you kind of look at that image in the middle um, just to take a peek at how to how you can use those um, the stems and the, the flower stalks from your um, native plants to create that ha nesting habitat for bees. Um, the picture that's in the bottom left, um, I actually took that uh, at the end of last month uh, before we started getting our snow here. And you can see that all the stems of the flowers and grasses, um, those are remaining standing. That's going to provide um, nesting sites for native pollinators and for those bees that I talked about. Um, and this is also providing great cover for a lot of wildlife during the winter um, and some probably some food resources as well with some of the seeds that came from those native flowers. Um, so again, that, that diversity of plants, it's important. Um, and it's important as some insects are considered specialists and they've evolved a specific relationship uh, with just a few or just one plant. Um, so if that certain plant isn't present, that habitat is, is not gonna be able to support that particular specialist pollinator um, or particular specialist insect. Um, so that diversity of plant species, if that's present, that's in turn going to um, support a diversity of insects and pollinators, um, and it's going to help your also help your odds of supporting any of those specialist insects. So if you've got a, a variety of plants, you're, you're going to see that variety of those insects as well. So um, one example of a specialist relationship um, that we're that that I'm going to mention um, is between the species of milkweed plants and the monarch butterfly. Um, we did want to spend some time tonight focusing on the monarch. Um, so what I'm going to do now is, now that we've talked about pollinator habitat, um, I'm going to kick it over to our next presenter, um, Donna Marie Duffin, and she's going to go into a little bit more detail about the monarch tonight. Um, so Donna Marie, I'll go ahead and kick it over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Kim. Let me just get my camera back on here. Okay, there we go. Can everybody see my slides, Kim? Can am I showing okay? Yep, I can see your slides and I can see you too. Perfect. Okay. Um, so thank you everybody obviously for joining us this evening and as Kim has already introduced me, my name is Donna Marie Duffin and I am the Monarch, Monarch and Pollinator Coordinator with Missourians for Monarchs. Um, and my portion of the presentation this evening will be solely focused on monarch butterflies um, simply because by default monarchs have become a flagship species for pollinators and for their habitat. And flagship species um, really just by definition means it's um, that they that it's a species that acts um, as an ambassador or an icon for defined habitat or issue. So I'm going to start with the worldwide monarch dis disbursement, and it really is more extensive than extensive than what most people think. So monarchs are indigenous to North America, and they've actually existed in North America for 20,000 years. And during the last two to 3,000 years. Um, there were three distinct dispersal events that gave rise to monarch populations on six other continents. Um, and each of these populations of monarchs on these six continents is genetically diverse and genetically unique. Now, the North American population, we have further divided 
into two separate populations, not because they're genetically distinct, um, but rather due to their behavior patterns, such as their migration process. Um, and basically, those two uh, populations are Eastern and Western, which both are in decline, unfortunately. I, I will make one side note real quick. Um, there is recent uh, scientific data that there's a third North American population, um, very small. It's only in Florida, but that population is genetically distinct from the other two North American populations. So from my presentation this evening, I'm only focusing on the East and the Western, Eastern and Western population. Um, so the Western population, as you can see from the picture on the screen, is essentially um, any monarch that lives west of the Rockies. And then likewise, the Eastern is any monarch that lives east of the Rockies. And just for clarification, I, I try to uh, highlight in Missouri to show where Missouri is and how key Missouri is within this population um, for the Eastern population. So regardless of which population of monarchs we're talking about, the life cycle for monarchs is pretty much the same. And, it, and it's, it's a four stage life cycle. So it's um, the egg, caterpillar or larva, pupa, and the adult butterfly. Uh, the egg process, the egg stage, um, actually it exists for about four days. Um, and then we move into the caterpillar phase, or again, larva phase. That will last for about two weeks. And then pupa will last 10 days. And then the adult butterfly, that, the length of that um, lifespan will actually depend, and I will elaborate on that a little bit, uh, a little bit more in a few minutes here. But starting with the egg, again, it's four days. Um, and female monarchs tend to lay their eggs, number one, they will only lay them on milkweed. Number two, they tend to lay them on the underside of leaves, but that's not a guarantee. There's a few rebels out there. Um, the eggs are incredibly small, and I've tried to show in this picture um, exactly how small it is on the, uh, on the underside of the leaf. Um, it's about the size of a pinhead, I, I think is, it would be probably the equivalent, but something else that's kind of interesting and scary is a female monarch can lay up to 500 eggs at one time. So it's quite, it's quite impressive. The, um, once the caterpillar emerges from the eggs after the four days, um, then we're into stage two, which is caterpillar or larva. So after emerging from its egg, which is exactly what that picture is to the right-hand side, that's a monarch caterpillar just moments after emerging from its egg being hatched. Um, the very first meal that a monarch caterpillar will actually ingest is the egg from which it just emerged. After that, the monarch caterpillars exclusively eat milkweed. And they eat a lot of milkweed. During just the two-week time period that they're in this life stage, the caterpillar will grow 3,000 times larger than the day it was hatched. And on the screen um, is an image of the five growth stages that occur during this two-week time period. Each of those growth stages is called an instar. So we have five instars, essentially. And so once the caterpillar is incredibly fat and happy and in the fifth, re and in the fifth instar, um, then it will move into the third stage, which is pupa. Essentially, the caterpillar will seek out a location that's safe or secluded as much as possible and begin the process of forming its chrysalis. Um, and to do this, it will attach itself using basically a silky web um, to whatever it has, it, has, it has moved to, whether it's a branch, a leaf, literally bicycle handlebars, whatever it seems to think was safe. Um, and it'll hang upside down in a J shape. It'll stay in that J shape for about 18, 24 hours, um, and then the formation of the chrysalis actually begins. It only takes the monarch caterpillar 10 minutes to fully form that chrysalis. For the, for the majority of the time that it's in the pupa, the 10 days, it's usually that green color, that jade color. The last day or so, it tends to start to look black, but I did a close-up picture on the screen to you guys to show that really what, it's, what it is is that's the coloration of the monarch starting to come through because the chrysalis actually goes clear. And so after the 10 days, the caterpillar, uh, well, during the 10 days, the caterpillar will metamorphosize into an adult butterfly. Then it will emerge as an adult monarch. 
um, when the first thing emerges, it will cling to the chrysalis or anything nearby. And it takes a few hours, but there's, there's fluids that are in the abdomen of the monarch. So as you see in this picture, this progressional uh, image, when, they, when the monarch adult first comes out, the, the wings are quite small and crumpled. So all of the fluids get pumped from the abdomen into the wings. So it's usually a few hours that it takes to pump the fluids, but then also for the monarch wings to, to dry. And during this time period, um, the monarch cannot fly. So if you ever see that happening and you see it fall off, pick, pick it up and put it back on because it's not going to survive if it falls onto the ground before its wings dry. Um, so not only is the, is the just the process of metamorphosis cool, um, but the monarch has something else on top of all the other butterflies that also go through metamorphoses. The monarch butterfly is also known to be the only insect, or say the only known insect, um, to complete up to a 2,800-mile multi-generational um, migration. And so, now, I, again, another little side note, only the eastern population of monarchs undertakes this multi-generational migration. Um, so as I'm going through these next slides talking about the migration, these are just for the eastern population. But this migration process requires four to five generations to complete the one migration cycle. And again, um, I highlighted Missouri in this image. Because Missouri is situated in the center for, you know, of the eastern population, um, we, we get monarchs through the state for both the spring and the fall migrations. And so this uh, map um, outlines where the generations um, are actually hatched and where they are created, produced, whatever word you want to use. So we in Missouri, because of our location, we actually get to host up to four generations each year of monarch butterflies. So the overall migration process occurs when that last generation in the fall will um, head southward. Uh, down, and that they will overwinter in the Oyamel fir trees in Mexico. They'll say they're all winter long. They do not feed. They flutter from time to time if the temps hit, you know, 70s or whatever. It's a nice, warm, uh, sunny day. But they, they, they feed very, very, very minimally while they're down there. Um, but when it warms up in the spring, they start to head north again. And they will seek out uh, mates, and then they will seek out milkweed to lay their eggs. Now, once them, and just as a little little sign here, once the monarch has laid her egg, her, she usually dies very soon after. So her life, her life, uh, her lifespan basically ends at that point. But once the eggs from that overwintering generation are hatched, those eggs actually, or that, you know, those eggs produce the first generation of this, of the new year, the new season. So that generation then continues, uh, further north and it's, or, Northeast even, um, and again, seeking out mates and milkweed to create the next generation. And once that generation is hatched, um, which is usually um, early summer, um, those eggs will now become second generation. And then generation, so the generations two through four basically repeat that same process. They move further north and northeast and continue the process. And then generations one through four each have a lifespan of two weeks to two months. And this is why I was saying earlier that the adult lifespan varies. So generations one through four, two weeks to two months. However, the last generation, um, which once it is eventually hatched, um, and it can be either a fourth or fifth generation, just depends on where the, what the weather is, environmental cues, things of that nature. Um, but once that generation um, is hatched, that generation will actually have a lifespan of seven to nine months. Um, and so the reason for this longer lifespan is um, when they're going to, that generation is the one's going to head down to Mexico. So instead of reproducing, they enter a uh, diapause phase. And diapause, um, honestly, it's just time period when they're reproductively dormant. It's just a fancy word. Um, but this allows them to conserve all their energy for the journey south down to the oil uh, fir trees in Mexico. Um, and so this is the overwintering generation. And then, um, the, fo and then the following season, this will basically all begin again. Um, but they will overwinter down there. And then given the fact that it takes four to five generations 
to complete the cycle, the migration cycle. And there's four life stages that this species has to make it through and survive without being predated or, you know, a violent storm or, you know, cut down, <laughs> whatever may happen. Um, you know, even in the best scenario, it's the, the monarchs, the butterflies, they have a challenge. So once we include the external threats, you know, that, that come along, it, it makes it even a little bit more challenging for them. So very quickly, I'm just going to go through some threats for the monarchs. Um, number one, loss of habitat. Um, and this is both milkweed decline and nectar resources. Um, so the milkweed decline, as previously stated, the monarch caterpillars feed exclusively on the milkweeds, and the female um, monarchs will only lay their eggs on the milkweeds. So essentially, no milkweed, no monarch. Um, nectar sources, preferably nadir, native nectar, nectar sources, um, very needed, as I said, to fuel, to fuel them all along their migration process, all the generations, but especially that last generation desperately uh, needs that fuel because, again, they're going to get all of the fuel that they have on their travels down to Mexico. They're not going to feed while they're down there, and then they have to make the, the, the flight back up. To, to Texas in the spring. So they have to have enough resources to basically fuel them for, you know, for two flights, um, you know, down to Mexico and then back up. And that's a lot of food. So um, the nectar resources are just as important as, as the milkweed resources for uh, the monarchs. And then, of course, indiscriminate use of pesticides and herbicides. You know, obviously, pesticides and herbicides um, will be used, and there, there is definitely a need for them in, in several situations. Um, but the best management practices when using these is essentially just closely follow the manufacturer's instructions. In this situation, more is not better. So whatever quantity and dilution rates um, are, you know, suggested by the ma manufacturer, that, you know, that's what should be used. Um, and obviously, don't spray um, on windy days, because if you spray on a windy day, that can allow for um, excessive drift of that product, thereby affecting um, plants and species that you may not have intended. Um, and then mowing at inappropriate times. And by inappropriate times, um, it's really just outside of like the wind or yeah, it's, it, the inappropriate time would be inside the window when the monarchs would be using it. So for Missouri, um, because regionally throughout the country, the times vary because it's seasonal based on season and when things are in bloom. So for Missouri, the recommendation time is to mow prior to March 15th and then to mow, or to mow after October 15th. And the reason that this has such an impact is, as I mentioned earlier, female monarchs can actually lay up to 500 eggs. And imagine if, you know, a female, you know, lays all, you know, the majority of her eggs in, you know, one vicinity, not on one plant, hopefully, but in one vicinity, and then, you know, that area gets mowed down. Well, there's 500 eggs that are clearly are not viable to make it into the next generation. And if that's happening all over in several locations, you can imagine the impact that can actually have. Another threat is illegal logging at their overwintering sites. Um, now, the Mexican authorities have made a lot of progress combating this threat. Um, and, and less of a threat than it used to be about mm, 10, even 20 years ago. But diligence and attention and funding for them is still very necessary and ongoing. And then climate change. Um, monarchs are extremely, well, butterflies in general, but pollinators in general, but monarchs are extremely susceptible to extreme weather conditions, uh, especially during the, the migratory flight. So whether it's um, a drought, um, which then can prohibit um, the necessary nectar and milkweed sources being there for them, um, or if it's um, a cold snap that comes through that's just too cold for them and, you know, they don't have shelter necessary. So there are climate changes um, that can have a big impact due to the extreme weather events that can occur from it. Um, so because of, you know, all of the challenges, all of the threats, we have seen declining populations, you know, over the years. So the chart or the graph on uh, your screen right now is for the eastern population. And these numbers are actually for not this past winter's overwintering. They're not 20, 2020 to 2021. It's for the prior last year's, 2019 into 2020. Um, the eastern population numbers aren't usually released until the beginning of March. So unfortunately, they weren't released in time for this uh, this webinar. But uh, 
as of that uh, year, we have, overall two decades, we've had about 90% decline in the eastern population. Last year, they occupied 2.83 hectares, um, which it's not horrible, but, you know, that's, it's still a 53% decrease from the prior year, which was a um, little over six hectare. Um, the Western population, even though I don't have a chart, I still wanted to touch on their numbers. The, these numbers um, on, the, on the screen are actually for 2020 into 2021 because they do their overwintering count in, in uh, October, November. So overall, the Western population is actually hurting even more so than the Eastern. Since just 1997, they have seen a 99.8% decline in their numbers. At one time in 1997, there was 1.2 million individual monarchs um, in the Western population. As of this past winter um, in uh, November, there's only 1,914 1, individuals. So that's pretty scary in all honesty. Um, now back to the Eastern population. Um, a goal was set for the Eastern population by a tri-national committee and that tri the tri-nations, the three nations are um, Canada, uh, United States, and Mexico. But they set a goal um, in conjunction with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well uh, back in 2014 to have an over a sustainable overwintering population that um, encompasses six hectares. So to date, since that goal was set, we've only accomplished that goal the one time. And the reason for that um, six hectare goal um, is actually due to the fact that, again, if there's an extreme event that occurs, if we consistently have, you know, a population of six hectare, then the population can more, more um, easily rebound from those extreme events. So when we go, when we're at, you know, 2.83, that's, that's obviously not enough if there's an extreme event for, for them to uh, rebound, especially depending on how extreme that event is. Now, at the same time, in 2014, as that goal was set, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, in August 2014, was actually petitioned um, to list the, um, the monarch on the Endangered Species Act as either a, an endangered or threatened species. And since that time, in 2014, States have been submitting yearly totals of newly created or managed monarch, monarch and pollinator habitats to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to try to provide data to, you know, aid them in their listing decision. And in um, December of 2020, um, just a couple months ago, the uh, announcement was made for their decision finding, um, which was warranted but precluded. Um, and essentially, this means that there is evidence to support the need for listing the monarch. However, there are other species that also warrant a listing. And at this time, given all the research that's been conducted, some of those other species are, are just a higher priority. Higher priority. Um, they are in uh, basically a higher peril of going extinct if the protections of the Endangered Species Act aren't applied to those species. Um, so for now, um, being warranted but precluded, the monarch is considered a candidate species, um, and it will be reviewed every year, um, the status of it. So uh, habitat numbers, um, population numbers, things of that nature. And so we will continue submitting data annually um, to help inform the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service regarding the quantity and quality of monarch and pollinator habitat that, is, that exists here in Missouri. So at this time, I will hand off the presentation to Elizabeth, who can elaborate a little bit further on the various ways to um, basically help create and establish monarch and pollinator habitat here in Missouri. Thank you very much, Donna Marie. Let me Absolutely. get myself situated real quick with my screens. All right, so the decline of pollinators is a heavy knowledge to bear, but we all can do our part. So how can you support pollinators? You can plant native, as simple as that. Planting native is fun and can have amazing results that are both beautiful and good for wildlife. 
As a beginning step, you can start incorporating natives in your existing gardens. Next, you can convert small spaces or problem areas into native plots. A mailbox planting is super easy and cuts down on pesky weed eating duties. We know about that. Developing a native planting in a problem area such as flood prone parts of your yard can reduce flooding and retain soil. If you want to convert your whole yard, but your homeowners association isn't really on the same page, you can do what we call a mullet. So you can go traditional in the front, have that nice green grass, but go wild with natives in the back. If your HOA approves of native yards, go crazy and convert that whole lawn. On this slide is an example of a garden design for a shaded front yard. You can find plenty more of these designs at grownative.org on their website. We're gonna list it later. So some of these practices were already talked about before. Uh, here are simple management practices you can implement to protect pollinators. You can reduce the use of pesticides and herbicides. When you do need to spray, use a nozzle that sprays only on what you intend. You can change your mowing practices by selective mowing only what is necessary and avoid mowing during migration seasons. If you have a larger property, prescribed fire is a fantastic tool. We'll provide contacts later in this presentation for those who, you know, you can contact their experts and we don't want you to burn your property down. So be sure to contact them before you do any prescribed fires. Native plantings can be incorporated in any setting. Parking lots, parking lot mediums are a great fit because they filter runoff when it rains. In parks, staff can create a story walk or science walk. Visitors can look for pollinators and learn about native plants. Schools can also benefit from planting native gardens for science class or to simply beautify a campus. Cities are starting to convert drainage sites along the roadway to filter runoff as well. You can see down in the bottom right corner, this is a native planting in Columbia, Missouri that the city put in. It is right next to the trail and a busy intersection. You can see it all summer and it is absolutely beautiful. In addition to establishing native habitat, you can join community conservation projects. The Missouri Bumblebee Atlas uses people just like you to collect, about, to collect data about bumblebees. Journey North collects data from across the country about pollinators, sightings, and tracks migrations. Occurring right now through the end of September, you can join Miles for Monarchs in the US and Canada as they collectively walk, bike, run, and paddle 3,000 miles. This is close to the same distance as the monarch butterfly migration. You can also increase your knowledge by becoming a master pollinator steward through the University of Missouri Extension. When you're ready to get habitat on the ground, Missouri has fantastic programs for you to utilize. Each of these programs deserve its, it deserves its own presentation to fully understand. Lucky for you, we will share the contact information of experts in your area who can give you the complete rundown of each of these programs. A couple more programs you can apply to are the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service partners with both fish and wildlife programs, both providing technical assistance and resources to get habitat on the ground. At this time, I'm going to hand this presentation over to Kim as she introduces you to the experts. Excellent. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Donna Marie. Let me get mine brought back up here real quick. All right. Can you see that just to make sure? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we have definitely talked about a lot tonight. Um, again, thank you, Don Marie. And thank you, Elizabeth. That was some excellent information about monarchs um, and then information about how we can all um, just do, do a little bit at home or, or do a lot um, to help pollinators in different ways. So um, again, we gave you all a lot of information tonight. Um, 
but the one thing that we really want to stress um, is there's there's help available. There's a lot of help available out there. Um, if you've got questions, we have um, there, there's a lot of people available who can can help provide answers to those questions. Um, whether you're dealing with small scale or large scale projects, um, there are resource professionals across our state. They can offer offer technical guidance um, for managing habitat for pollinators and wildlife. Um, they can help our landowners navigate the different programs uh, um, available for financial assistance as well. Um, on the screen right now, you'll kind of see our PF and PFQF in Missouri uh, field stat map. Um, we've got a team of Farm Bill wildlife biologists um, across the state. Um, and our biologists work with landowners to help them meet their habitat goals. Um, we can visit with you on your property. We can learn. Um, we can learn what you'd like to do on your land, and then we can provide um, recommendations as well for managing your land um, and keeping your goals in mind and keeping natural resource conservation in mind as well. Um, Again, here's our map where staff are located. Um, I do realize this is probably small print, depending on if, um, your computer screens or some of you are on, are on your phones. Um, so this is a resource, um, not, not only the map, but the link. These are resources we're going to include when we send that email out to everybody next week. Um, so you'll have a link to our website and then a link to this staff map as well. Um, so you'll have the contact information for um, any of our biologists that are, that are local to your area. Um, a couple other options for you. Um, there is the Missourians for Monarchs um, website. They have a really easy to use find an expert tool. Um, this is what you, you can go there and use this tool um, to search for a resource professional. You can search by county, you can search by um, the professional's name if you've worked with someone before. Um, you can search by the organization or agency that they work for, um, and you can even search by the cost share program that you're interested in. So if you know you want to potentially look into CRP, you can search for a professional to help, help you um, just based on that criteria alone. Um, you can also contact the Missouri Department of Conservation. They've got private land conservationists um, in the counties throughout Missouri. Um, just visit their website and you can click on the contact and engage tab at the top. Um, Another thing that we recommend, um, if you're interested in enrolling in the cost share programs, if you think you'd like to look more into um, those programs to get that financial assistance for some of these projects, um, we recommend that you reach out to your county uh, USDA, FSA, and NRCS office. Um, so find that find that county USDA office. Um, We'll send the link out for you to be able to do that as well. Um, but we recommend getting in touch with them um, and they're going to be able to help kind of with the el eligibility questions and things like that that you've got. Um, we've also got um, just some other options for help that's available out there. Um, I'm going to provide, again, provide all these links to everybody after the webinar. Um, Elizabeth mentioned a few of these already, but there are lots of native plant and pollinator gardening resources um, available online and help um, helps available through numerous organiz organizations as well um, that are all focused on pollinator and native habitat conservation. Um, Grow Native and the Missouri Prairie Foundation and Deep Roots KC, um, these are great resources for information about native plants, Monarch Joint Venture, um, and, and also the Missourians for Monarchs. Um, their websites are great resources for some Monarch-specific information. Um, Pollinator Partnership and Xerxes Society, they have a ton of information um, about pollinators. Um, you can also find local plant guides. So if you want to put native plants um, in, depending on where you live in Missouri, or if we've got anybody tuning in um, from outside of Missouri, you can visit their websites um, and download plant guides that will give you information on plants that are um, local to your area and those really native species that are going to do well where you live. Um, University of Missouri Extension is another one. They have a lot of great resources um, just in general about habitat management um, and some specifics on pollinators and quail and other wildlife. Uh, but again, these are just a few. There are tons of resources out there. Um, the ones that we've talked about tonight, we're gonna make sure to share those links with everybody when we send that email out next week. Um, so with that, I think we're gonna work on taking um, some questions. I do wanna say thanks to everyone um, who submitted those to the Q&A. We had lots of questions come in tonight. Um, and so also thanks to our staff that we kind of had. Um, we had some of our farm bill biologists helping us out kind of behind the scenes tonight to answer those questions. So thanks to, to those guys as well for sending in answers while, while we were uh, talking to everybody. Um, if anybody else does have questions, feel free to keep submitting those um, through the Q&A. We've got just a few minutes, um, but I'm going to try to go through as many of those as we can. A lot of those were answered already, um, so I'm just going to try to to skim through some of these real quick, read those, those uh, questions out loud, and then the answers as well. Um, 
So one that came in kind of having to do with some of the um, pollination that happened that, that Elizabeth talked about at the beginning. The question was, is there a known proportion of pollination that occurs via living versus non-living modalities? Um, and for that one, about 80% of all plant pollination is by animals. And then the remaining 20% um, is of the abiotically pollinated species. Um, so when we're looking at wind and water and things like that. So um, for those of you who are tuned in, you can also see these answers in that Q&A feature if you want to read through some of those or well, uh, read through some of those as well. Um, another one that came in, I planted 22 acres of uh, Monarch 30 the first week of December. One, one of the um, photos of native wildflowers, what is the rough age for some of these prairies we are seeing, or what could I expect for growth in the first year given good conditions? Um, so it's a really good question kind of about what to expect when it comes to pollinator habitat. Um, so for the answer we've got for this one, typically these mature stands are four years old and higher. So some of those pictures that, that we're seeing are um, with all those really pretty well-established flowers are a few years old. Um, what a, a kind of a saying that we typically use is sleep, creep, leap. Um, and so that first year, you're going to see a few species starting that are going to be growing and expressing themselves. Um, and then each year, each following year after that, you're going to see more and more species that start to express as those species, species mature. Um, and then in a few years, just have a little patience with it. And you're going to have a really nice uh, mature pollinator habitat stand. So um, just have patience with those, those pollinator plots. They may not look big and beautiful that first year, but that patience is definitely going to pay off for you. Um, we also had a question come in um, about, so I, I had kind of talked about that golf course and pollinator habitat being on a golf course. Um, and this is a great question. How does pollinator habitat in a golf course work? Um, I live on a golf course and my neighbor had beehives. Every time the course would spray or fertilize, which was frequently to keep the grass green and weed free, um, her bees would die. She finally gave up on trying to keep bees. Um, so a, a quick answer that um, Andrew provided for us, one of our biologists, uh, Monarchs in the Rough is a partner program with gold courses across the country, or with golf courses across the country. Um, these are planted in the roughs along the, along the golf course, and most golf courses have to adapt their management plans to prevent what happened um, to your friend from happening. So Monarchs in the Rough is a program. Um, the picture that I showed of that golf course is one, um, it's, it's in Columbia, Missouri. Um, with the pollinator habitat that they've put in on that golf course, um, the staff at the golf course and the, the maintenance team that help, um, you know, help maintain the, the grounds at the golf course um, have worked pretty closely with the resource professionals in the area um, and basically have have made big changes to those practices when it comes to spraying and fertilizing and different things um, with the intention of not only protecting the, the bees and pollinators that use that habitat, uh, but just changing those management practices to be a little more environmentally friendly as well. So um, that was a really great, great question that came in. Um, let's see. Let me scroll through these here real quick. Um, this is one that we got. Um, do pollinators eat dirt sometimes? That's a really great question. Um, so a couple of answers that our biologists put in for that one. Um, several organisms will eat soil from time to time if their diet is in a lack of certain nutrients. Um, some Also another answer, some insects gather dirt and mud to help form nests and is often mistaken as them eating the soil. Um, so sometimes, yes, you might see um, looks like a bee, bee or pollinator gathering dirt, um, and they might just be using that for their nest, um, or again, getting those, those nutrients that they might be lacking as well. So um, a couple other quick ones. Uh, what habitat and food do monarchs need on their spring migration? Um, milkweed's a big one. Um, once they leave their wintering grounds, they're, they're going to encounter that milkweed, um, and that milkweed's as Donna Marie talked about, that's really critical to the monarchs for them to have an, a site to lay their eggs and for those larvae to have a food source when they when they emerge. Um, nectaring forbs, um, or again, forbs are those wildflowers, in addition to milkweed, um, those are also important for monarchs because that's going to provide a, a nectar source um, as well. They can get some nectar from that milkweed, um, but having a, a diverse array of forbs as well is going to provide them some really good, good nectar resources. Um, we had a we had a lot of questions come in for the sake of time. We're at just about seven o'clock tonight. Um, so if anybody did have a question um, that we didn't get answered, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I put all of our presenters' emails up on that last slide there. Um, so feel free to shoot us an email. 
Um, again, we're going to send you some contact information. So you'll have our um, phone numbers for us three presenters tonight, as well as contact information for all of our biologists. Um, so again, reach out if you've got questions. Um, we're here to help. Our biologists are here. And there's tons of professionals um, from some of the other organizations and agencies that we work with as well that are that are out there and available to help um, as you're trying to put in pollinator habitat or just wildlife habitat in general. Um, one last reminder, we are recording tonight. Um, we're recording the webinar, so we're going to share the link to that. I'll email that out to everyone um, probably early next week with the recording um, for the webinar. It's also going to be posted on the uh, Missouri Quill Forever YouTube channel and then on the Missourians for Monarchs YouTube channel as well. Um, so you'll have a few options for, for viewing that webinar, um, but just look for all those resources to come early next week. And I'd like to say thank you again um, to our presenters, Elizabeth and Donna Marie. You guys did an excellent job tonight. Um, thanks again to our staff helping answer questions. Um, and thanks to everybody who joined us. I hope you guys have a, a great rest of the night and um, just shout if anybody's got questions about pollinators. Thanks everybody, take care. <laughs>